All right, welcome to part four of the software engineering lecture. And today's topic uh, is now going to be software processes. So now we're going to look at one of the core elements of, of developing software, and that is how to actually structure the process. So uh, if we look at the uh, quotes from the from the Summerwill book, from the, the uh, big software engineering Bible, so to say, then uh, well, it's quite obvious software processes are activities involved in producing a software system. So all of the things involved in actually building a software system are part of these processes and uh, software process models are, as all models are, abstract representations of these processes. And I think one of the most important things to keep in mind uh, during this lecture is you, you can't have one process that is suitable for all software development projects. Uh, there are different process models for very good reasons because there are different uh, types of software that you want to build and uh, one size doesn't fit all. So uh, you will always have to consider uh, the environment and the specific software you're developing and the goals you have and so on uh, when considering which type of software process to actually use. All right, so what do all of these software processes usually have in common? There's four fundamental parts to each of them. Uh, the very first one is the f uh, software specification. Then it's followed by the software design and the actual implementation. Then we have uh, validation and testing, and we have software evolution. This is also something we shouldn't ne neglect. Software will have to be maintained and adapted to changing uh, environment conditions and so on. So this is also part of any software process. Um, and the major parts, which um, also most of these processes have in common is that we have uh, products, which are something that comes out of each of these activities. We have roles, which re uh, relate to the people that are involved. And uh, for each activity, we usually have some pre and post conditions that have to be fulfilled before we can start the activity and that should be fulfilled after the activity has completed. So one uh, product that comes out of the uh, specification uh, activity is that we have a specification document or a uh, written down um, a account of how we want the software to actually perform basically. So now let's look at each of these in turn. Um, software specification, I already mentioned this is supposed to define what functions your, your software is supposed to provide and what constraints there are. Um, sometimes this is also called requirements engineering because you're uh, trying to discover the requirements that are uh, uh, asked of the software basically and uh, basically all software processes you have to start with some kind of software specification because it's obvious that before you can sit down and start writing code you usually should actually think about what you need and uh, what you need to deliver. Um, there's quite a number of, of sub activities that can be um, that can be involved here and I'd like to show you these uh, sub activities at the example of a diagram. So the very first thing which we should usually do, except in, in very simple and obvious cases, is a feasibility study. So we should try and see if we can actually um, solve the um, initial requirements that are uh, posed to the software, uh, to the proposed software, if we can solve this given the current uh, state of the art, basically. Um, and the result of this feasibility study is always a feasibility report that can be really short, can be a couple of lines just describing why this is probably doable or probably not doable. And um, here's a, a, uh, as a, as a 
short aside, here's a, a little explanation of why this is actually quite hard sometimes. So especially for somebody who is not involved in computer science, um, it, as the caption says, it can actually be quite difficult to, to tell the difference between things that are pretty easy and things that are very hard. So uh, testing whether uh, somebody using a, taking a photo is in a national park it's quite easy because there's databases for that that just tell you based on the uh, coordinates if this is a national park or not. But checking whether there's a bird in the photo is really hard actually. This is state-of-the-art image recognition. So um, this is quite a different thing altogether. And so for somebody who's not doesn't have a big uh, computer science background, um, it can sometimes be quite hard to, to tell the difference between what's easy and what's really difficult. So uh, the feasibility study is usually kind of interleaved with the very first part of requirements elicitation. So you talk to people who are uh, kind of stakeholders in the system who later want to, to, to use it, for example, or who, who are your customers who give you the, the um, task of building a specific software. You talk to these people and try to discover the requirements. Therefore, it's also called a dissertation. And you analyze these requirements. Um, and again, interleaved with this is the specification, actually writing down these requirements in a structured way. And uh, last but not least, you should also validate these requirements to see if they will actually match the expectations of the, um, of the let's call them customers uh, or users later. And uh, all of these uh, with intermediate products like system models and the user and systems requirements should then in the end lead to some kind of documentation that uh, gives you a fixed point, a fixed uh, yeah, documentation for the requirements that you can then later refer to. Um, two terms that very often come up in requirements, uh, specification and elicitation and so on, are user and system requirements. So I'd like to talk about these in a bit more detail. Um, in German, uh, if, if you ever work on a German language project, then these are often called Lastenheft and Pflichtenheft. Uh, user requirements is the Lastenheft, and these, uh, this is a document in natural language, maybe with a couple of additional diagrams, and it should uh, tell you what services the system should provide and what constraints there are that the system needs to observe. And um, this is often basically written by the by the customer. If you have a, a call for bits, for example, for a larger project, then the customer will actually write this uh, user requirements document and put it online, and then other companies can um, can, for example, subscribe to that and make a proposal if they what what they would like to to implement based on these requirements. The other side then is the uh, system requirements, in German it's sometimes called Pflichtenheft, and this is a description of the actual functions and what's supposed to be implemented later. And this is then usually part of the contract between the two companies. So um, the one half of this is what the, was the customer uh, hands out to people to describe what they actually expect. And the other part is what the um, developer then writes to describe what they're going to do. Um, so the user requirements are the customer view and they have a very, uh, often they have a very rigid structure. There's, this is an example what's often used in, in uh, a German context, but this can also occur in other, uh, in other countries, of course. So we have uh, the goals, of course, but this is the most important thing after all. What should the software actually do? Then we have an application area which describes the, um, the context in which it's going to be, um, to be used. Uh, functions and data are a kind of uh, a detailed view of the goals. So what 
actual features uh, should the should the system provide and what data is it going to process then are there additional services that the um, system is supposed to provide beyond what's already been described here then do we have any quality requirements this is an especially important topic so th these can also be requirements and i'll talk about them in more detail later but an example for these quality requirements for example would be to say that the um, software should have a response time of at most 10 milliseconds or on, on a given on a given system or that it should have an uptime of at least 99.995 percent per year or something like that and yeah last but not least we have an appendix for for supporting documents of course um, and the next step now going from the user requirements to the system requirements this is now the developers view and here it's come to take the original data from the uh, user requirements and extend them with extra sections like the product environment. So what does the developer expect uh, about the, the environment? What, for example, what operating system is the, the system supposed to work on is, is exactly which versions and so on? Then what quality goals do we have? So yeah, what um, quality how are the quality requirements going to be tested then what other test scenarios are we going to to uh, to use to verify our system w how are we going to develop the, uh, the the system this is also an important part and again last but not least an appendix uh, regarding supporting documents so now this of course this doesn't have to be exactly identical to the uh, original user requirements this is something that uh, so the end result of these documents is something uh, that should be created in a dialogue between the the customers and the developers and customer now um, i'm using this term in a very wide sense so to say um, so anybody that gives you a task that you as a developer should be implemented is in a very loose sense your customer even if you're uh, if it's in the university context and you're not explicitly having a, a specific development contract for example so if you have a student assistant job and uh, somebody asks you to implement something uh, th within that job then these people are your customers who want a specific piece of software to be written and you're the developer and then you should have a dialogue with them to figure out what the exact requirements for the software are of course in such a uh, such an environment you will probably not write a specific um, user and system requirements document every time but uh, it's still important to to discuss with the uh, with between developer and customer what uh, the goals of the software for example are and what constraints there are to be observed and so on all right so i'd like to show you an example from the book here um, regarding how uh, user requirements might look like and how the uh, system requirements that derive from these user requirements uh, might then look like so the user requirements are relatively high level these are f wishes for features that the customer has and in this context it's about a medical uh, management system so a patient management system for a hospital and what the users ask for the customers is that they have monthly management reports with the cost of, of which prescription drugs have been issued by each clinic and uh, so this is still quite quite high level and quite weak so system requirements um, should be something that that can actually be tested during development and afterwards uh, when the software is handed over and so these are much more specific so it tells you that on the last working day of each month uh, create a summary of the drugs and then print this report automatically after 5.30 on each last working day and so on. Um, 
list each individual drug, number of prescriptions, and so on. If there's different dose units, then list each dose unit separately. And also, for example, what's very important, access, uh, restrict, um, restrict access to these reports to authorized users. And it actually specifies which users are authorized, those listed on a specific management control list. So um, from this very short user requirements, we can generate quite a bit of, uh, of system requirements because they need to be very specific, very precise, and uh, they should also uh, it should also be possible to actually test them, to write a unit test uh, for them, for example. Um, so if you run the system in your test scenario and uh, the date is, uh, the, uh, is the last working day of a specific month, the test date basically, then the system should actually generate this report. And if it doesn't, then you still have a bug that you need to, need to fix first. Um, in any requirement specification, it's important also to differentiate between functional requirements and non-functional requirements. A functional requirement is obviously uh, simply what the system should be able to do or should not do. Something like have a search function or um, all the things from the previous slide uh, generate a report on the last working day of each month and, and so on. All of these are functional requirements. And on the other hand, we can also have non-functional requirements such as those listed here. Um, response time, I already mentioned this, security, ease of use, all of these are things that aren't tied to one specific system function. Um, downtime during normal working hours shall not be more than five seconds per day, so for example. This is a non-functional requirement. And of course, for something like a, a hospital management system, this is quite important. Because if it's five minutes, then you might actually start to, to run into problems already. So this is a quite important requirement, actually, even if it's not connected to one specific function. Or um, if you have uh, requirements Especially in large companies, you often get things like your system must conform to this and this standard, uh, then this is also a non-functional requirement. Um, these requirements, these non-functional requirements can actually lead to other functional requirements again. For example, if you have security requirements, then um, even if they're non-functional uh, on their own, they might in turn require you, for example, to implement a access control system, a login uh, and password form or something like that. These are then on their own, their functional requirements, even if they are derived from other non-functional uh, requirements. Or if you um, have non-functional requirements uh, regarding reliability, then you might need to uh, implement some kind of redundancy in your system so that you ha always have a, a up-to-date backup system running and uh, things like that. So there's quite a bit of uh, interrelation between the, those um, individual types of uh, requirements, but uh, you can still split them roughly into those two classes. All right, so let's assume we're done with our requirements. The next step is the actual implementation. So now we go from the specification which we created previously to something we can actually run, uh, something we can execute. And um, this can again be split into sub-activities like first the design of the system and the actual implementation. Um, design involves uh, using things like UML, uh, architecture, sketches, um, and you can have design at quite a number of levels. You can have, first of all, uh, on a very high level, the architectural design, then the interface and component design. There's also aspects like the database design, for example, if you have a database-oriented system. And on the other hand, then we have turning this abstract design into actual code, the actual implementation. Um, depending on what software process model we use, uh, 
this is usually quite interleaved with the uh, design stage. So um, you will usually never be able to come up with a perfect design on the very first try. You will uh, have to attempt to actually implement it and then you will notice that some aspects of your design aren't quite perfect and you will need to refine them. Uh, maybe you find uh, during testing and debugging, which is also part of the implementation, you find bugs that can be traced back to, to flaws in the design. And then you will once again just have to adapt your design and then uh, go back to the impl implementation and um, switch back and forth between those two. So um, the book uh, gives this as an example of how you can go from the requirement specification to the actual design. And in general, this goes from a very high level architectural design uh, over uh, interface design, component design, and so on to a, to a lower level. The one thing I wouldn't quite um, uh, consider fitting here is the algorithm design. This is actually quite something that's uh, involved at a far higher level because you can't first design your data structures and then your algorithms usually at, at least has to be the other way around it. Uh, data structures and algorithms are quite interleaved in many um, in many cases, but uh, in general, of course, you go from a higher uh, level of design to a to a lower, more detailed level of design. Um, and what's also important to keep in mind is usually that this is not a, a strict sequence of things. You can and you have to often go back uh, and forth in this chain and change things in the architecture. Uh, if you notice during component design, for example, that there are some things that just don't fit well with each other. All right, um, so much for the implementation at this point. Uh, then we also need a, a validation stage, of course. And this is usually called verification validation. There's a very nice, um, nice uh, summary of what these mean. Validation is the question, are we building the right product? So that means is what we're building actually something that uh, matches what the customer expects. Um, this involves that we do things like user testing. So we actually let uh, end users test our uh, better version of our software, for example. And we do something called acceptance testing. So we uh, use data that the customer gives us that's uh, representative of the data which the system will be, um, will be processing in real life usage and if we can prove that our system can successfully process that data then it will probably also work with the the data it will later encounter in in the in real world usage so this is validation and on the other hand we have verification are we building the product right so are we making any mistakes while we're building the product under the assumption uh, that it's actually matching the, the customer's expectations. Then we still need to make sure that there are no bugs in there. And this involves things like unit testing, which we talked about last time. So we uh, create our own data sets. We, for example, also create data th sets that uh, might have errors that um, will are, are intended to trigger, to trigger bugs in the code and uh, that will hopefully help us to, to find those bugs and fix them. And we do um, integration testing and system testing and so on to actually see if our individual building blocks um, mesh together. The book once again um, shows this as a very uh, precise sequence of, of activities. So from the requirement specification and the other um, parts of the design, we uh, first derive an acceptance test plan, then integration test plan, subsystem integration test plan, and unit tests. And then we co uh, conduct each of these in uh, turn. And after the acceptance test has passed, we go to the service. In reality, it's of course, in almost all cases, not such a exact and clear sequence of things. Um, 
So the first part is actually, uh, in my opinion, the most correct one. Um, acceptance testing with user supplied data should uh, something we should agree upon at a very early stage to make sure that um, we are building our software for the right use cases. So if we switch back uh, once more, this is the validation part. Are we building the right product? And this involves, of course, uh, testing it with real world data to prove that it, our software, our system can actually handle the sort of data it's supposed to handle um, in, in the future too. All right, um, last but not least, uh, there's also the final of, uh, one of those four activities, software evolution or software maintenance. And this is something that's actually uh, often overlooked a little. So the software is done, we deliver it to the customer and that's it. But of course, that's not how it's supposed to be. Um, we should always consider maintenance as an integral part of our software process because the actual costs for uh, maintaining and keeping software running over time might be higher than the cost for the initial development. And so this is definitely not something that um, that should be, should be overlooked. Um, because we need uh, the environment will change, the requirements might change. We don't want to to start from scratch every time, so we need to um, keep our software up to date and keep it somehow uh, running, even in the face of changing requirements and the changing environment. And this is something we we need to uh, not lose sight of, basically. Um, one thing I'd like to mention in this context is the um, so-called uh, not invented here syndrome. This is something many software developers are kind of uh, prone to, is to start building everything from scratch. And this is not necessary usually. So um, there's, a, um, there's a balance somewhere between uh, taking everything off the shelf and uh, building something that's actually completely done uh, done in-house, basically. So um, one important part uh, that nobody should should kind of forget about is to just evaluate at existing systems and see what which of those existing systems might uh, already fit parts of your requirements and which of them might be uh, might be useful could be maybe adapted to um, create a new overall system that doesn't have to be created entirely from scratch. So uh, usually you don't write your own uh, date and time libraries and you don't write your own string processing classes too because they're already provided by Java. Um, so you shouldn't try to reinvent the wheel in, in many scenarios. So especially with uh, open source software, it's actually quite simple now to, to modify existing systems in such a way that they better fit your requirements. Once again, without having to start from scratch, you can just take the source code of an existing system. Of course, you have to, to respect its licenses, but uh, in many cases, you can just uh, adapt it to your, to your needs and then use it, uh, continue to use it um, in your new system and save a lot of, a lot of work in the process. All right.